Sona, should I start? No, sir. I'll start. I'll be kind of introducing. Okay. He said a 10 second pause. So that's why I was just waiting. Okay. Okay. Just give me two minutes. And we are live. We can start. Yeah. A very good evening to all Physio TV viewers. Today uh, at Physio TV, we are starting a grand new series called Grand Rounds of Physiotherapy. It's a unique show or a unique series that we are starting. And this initiative has been helped by our mentor and guide, Dr. Anil Bhave from Maryland, Baltimore. I mean, and uh, to just give a brief introduction to Dr. Bhave, we all know him now. He has taken a lot of talks with Physio TV and has been a part of our Physio TV family for a long time now. So as a clinical director of orthopedic rehabilitation and the director of the Wasserman Gate Laboratory at the Rubin Institute of Advanced Orthopedics at Sinai Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland in USA. He's a recipient of several awards, including the Jacqueline Perry Award, the IAP Oration Award, as well as the champion of care at Sinai Hospital almost four times. He has a few patents uh, of apps as well as uh, braces. He has done a lot of certifications, which includes latest techniques like blood flow restriction therapy, ASTIM, as well as dry needling. He has been instrumental in establishing the gate lab at Sinai Hospital, as well as developing the rehab protocols for various musculoskeletal conditions, including prehab and post-op management, which has now become a standard of care at various institutions, sorry, institutions nationally, as well as internationally. So it is a consultant for therapeutic modality companies, including Stryker and Cymedica. He's on the editorial board of many peer-reviewed journals, including physical therapy, JOS PT, uh, sorry, Journal of Orthopedic Research, Clinical Biomechanics, just to name a few. Sir has worked on numerous grant projects and has about 76 publications in peer-reviewed journals. He has authored many textbooks in textbooks of rehabilitation as well as orthopedics and is a faculty for the annual Baltimore Limb Deformity course, an annual hip and knee course, and the faculty at the School of Physical Therapy at Maryland and Virginia. He has been a course chairman at 15 courses and given 341 lectures, national as well as international in about nine countries. So we welcome you today, sir, for this very unique series that we start. Just to give you all a brief outline, we will be kind of taking in real case discussion. Uh, so we'll be kind of highlighting or showcasing one of the cases. And today's case is on early post total knee arthroplasty. Uh, that's going to be about zero to two weeks post-surgery. And sir is going to take us through a process where he'll be discussing what assessments were done, uh, what impairments were seen, and likewise, how the things were managed. Why we do this? Because we have named it Grand Rounds. We also have our musculoskeletal postgraduate physiotherapy students with us today at Tom Sancheti Hospital or Sancheti Institute College of Physiotherapy will be joining us in this very live interactive discussion about the case. So welcome one and all, and I hope it's a very fruitful session today. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sona, uh, for uh, introduction. And uh, let's see. Okay, everybody can see my slides? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. thank you. So, uh, I've, you know, I have been already introduced, so I don't need to introduce myself, uh, but um, it's my pleasure to meet all the students. Um, the students are the future of uh, our profession, and uh, it's important that they hear from us and our mistakes. So uh, <clears throat> I work at Sinai Hospital. Uh, we specialize in orthopedic uh, rehabilitation. We perform approximately 1,200 total knee replacement surgeries every year. And uh, we have a very uh, great uh, physician as well as therapy team that uh, helps us uh, get the patients better. 
So has anybody, has everybody seen a knee replacement surgery or a total knee replacement? I mean, everybody has. So you have seen the noise that the bone saw makes. You have heard the noise of bone saw and you have all heard the banging of the prosthesis and the trial prosthesis and then the final prosthesis. So in my, uh, there is, um, in my opinion, it's like taking a cricket bat and hitting the knee multiple times, uh, actually, but it's done in a very controlled fashion. And it's done in such a way that you are very careful to remove only as much bone as needed. Uh, in, a, in a, as much bloodless fashion as possible. So the advances in total, total knee replacement are tremendous uh, in terms of prosthetic design. The original uh, metal has been modified multiple times to get to a point where you have a most inert alloy material that's on the metal side. And then the poly is uh, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, uh, very expensive, uh, made uh, just for joint replacements to withstand years and years and decades of pressure. And if you consider that we walk about one, one million to two million steps a day, uh, a day, I'm sorry, a year, and we do it for 10 years, that's 15 to 20 million steps per patient. But these prostheses are now lasting up to 15 to 20 years. So the, the machining, the polishing, the metal component, the plastics, the insertion technique, the cementing technique, or even non-cemented total knee replacements, the patellar resurfacing, all have gone to the level where they can last a long time and give patient a pain-free, successful activities as well as ambulation. Around that also, a lot of new things have happened where there is less blood loss with TXA. <coughs> there is a use of tourniquet time very judiciously so that there's not too much bleeding. And when you're doing the cementing, the bloodless field is there. There is this whole idea about multimodal analgesia, uh, which is something that is practiced by almost every center that does uh, major total knee surgery. A multimodal analgesia is basically an injection into the joint at the end of the surgery with bupivacaine and putting patient on and putting in prednisone with it and then putting, giving a patient a Celebrex and sometimes doing nerve blocks to block the pain for 72 hours. So that is a standard of care now uh, in most major hospitals. And also the standard of care is that patients walk same day and are moving and walking around and ranging their knee as soon as possible. Most patients get some type of uh, anticoagulation and uh, uh, that is a part of the process uh, depending on the risk stratification of the patient. And we don't have to go into detail about that, but you can start with uh, from Coumadin to Warfarin to Lovenox to Aristra to uh, Advil, or not Advil, I mean aspirin are all anticoagulates and they can be used very well to uh, prevent uh, incidence of DVT, which can be then a pulmonary embolism. So that's one of the risk factors of a total knee displacement. And the, the additional risk factors are obesity, hypertension, previous uh, blood supply or problems with the you know, one artery leg, et cetera. And we need to be able to diagnose early problems of calf tenderness, whether they have a, a positive sign for a blood clots and alert. Many times you will find that you will have ultrasound presence of blood clots, but they are not symptomatic. So not, not every patient that uh, gets a total knee gets an ultrasound to rule out blood clot. 
But if you see clinical symptoms or signs, you need to alert people early on. Uh, earlier you catch it, better it is, and you can treat it very effectively without having the, the grave consequence, which is a pulmonary embolism, which is basically a clot going up into the lungs and stopping the blood supply and patient either getting a really bad chest pain or dying from it. So that's, that's, that's a severe complication. Ambulation, isometrics all help to, to move. If you move the patient faster, you have a less chance of having problems, circulatory problems with the patient, as well as you have less respiratory complications by, by moving the patient. So the, the, that is part of the process. So everybody knows what multimodal analgesia is. Do you know what that, what I'm really meaning by that? No. So I'll explain that a little bit. There are two, three ways to do this. You know, we are used to in 1960s and 70s, we did uh, what we call injection of morphine. So when you were lying in bed, you were in pain, the nurse came with this big syringe with morphine injection, and you just rolled over to your one, one buttock, you raised your other buttock, they pushed your pants down, and you, they pushed the morphine in. That was the standard of care uh, for pain management. Then, you know, we started doing a little bit better. We called it patient control analgesia, where patients were able to actually control and push the button and get, get medicine. In the whole process, we made the patient very sick from morphine overdoses and they didn't move well, they had problems and complications. So then came this whole idea of not giving a general anesthetic, giving a spinal anesthesia so that you're not really making the patient groggy. That's one advance. Then came the idea that we should block the nerves. So you do an adductor canal block for the, for the femoral block Femoral number block can cause some uh, weakness of the cord muscle, so more preferably was the adductor canal block done under ultrasound guidance. And then there is this whole injection cocktail, injection of cocktail. Bupivacaine is a, a derivative, a painkiller, and then injection of prednisone into the joint capsule just before you close the joint capsule and close the incision. And then with that, sometimes they did bolus uh, dose of Celebrex to reduce inflammation. Because remember, when you have the surgery, you are going into an inflammatory phase. It lasts for about two weeks. And you have to protect the patient for two weeks because they are in inflammatory phase. And we'll talk about that. So that's the multimodal. What allowed us to do with the, I am sure you are using something like that at Sancheti Hospital. Go check your records. There is a, there is a accelerated totally program that you guys are doing there. And if you look at the notes, you will see that they are using some type of multimodal analgesia, maybe not doing blocks, maybe injecting capsule. You'll have to check your notes and see what they're doing. Most people are doing it now. So that controls the pain for about 48 to 72 hours. So you can mobilize the patient faster, quicker. And they can be, uh, they can be mobilized. They are not in excruciating pain. A normal surgery, uh, skin to skin, is anywhere between 30 to 45 minutes. The recovery time is about, recovery room time is between two and three hours. After that, they are brought to the patient room. And then we, at our center, see the patient same night. So we have therapists that work until 9 p.m., 8 p.m., not 9, 8 p.m., and we'll see them. And the main purpose is to mobilize the patient that night so that they are not lying down for 24 hours without moving. That's the idea. Some centers still do it next day, early morning before breakfast. So you know, if you have surgery, you stay in bed for that night, and then next day morning you do it. Earlier you move the patient, better it is for the patient confidence, for their ambulation, gait, transfers, all of that. So any questions on this so far? Students, this is interactive. You have to, if you don't ask questions, I will ask questions, so go ahead.
Okay, we'll proceed. Um, so the journey of the patient uh, is what I described for the day one. What are our responsibilities and how can we, you know, in medicine, there is something called do no harm. The first thing of treatment or first line of treatment is do no harm. So how can we be effective and still do no harm? That's important, okay? So this is what we are aiming for finally. This is what we want, return to function approximately two to three months from surgery where they are able to be functional. They are able to have full knee extension, good mobility, good control of their muscles so they can function the way they want. And when you achieve results like this, they last for a long, long time. You know, I'm a therapist, I'm a PT now for 44 years. This is my 44th year as a therapist. And I, I have seen patients who have had surgery 20, 25 years ago come back and having great results. But it's important to remember that what you do in the first three months or first two weeks matters. For example, if patient is on an anticoagulant, let's say he's a high-risk patient and he's on anticoagulant and you move him too fast and you cause hemarthrosis and the knee joint gets stiff. That needs exploration of the joint, meaning you have to open it up, remove the hematoma, close it, and then again wait for it to heal before you do therapy. That's gonna delay your recovery significantly. If he has, if develops a deficit in the flexion in, the, in late, Sir, I think uh, there's a problem of Wi-Fi. Can everyone hear him? No, ma'am. No, uh, ma'am. So no, ma your video froze and you're not audible. I guess there's some Wi-Fi issue. I guess we'll just wait for sir to join in. I'll just call up sir. Just trying to call up, sir. I'm sorry, there's been a little technical glitch. So we'll just try to sort it out as soon as possible. Yes, I just received a message from sir. Sir, I guess we'll be joining soon. He just lost connection. Tushar, sir? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so sir can join in, right? Yes, yes, yes. I'll just give it a couple of minutes. Sorry for that.
so as sir mentioned let it be a more interactive session so i guess if you all have any questions regarding whatever you all see or sir discusses even in terms of you know uh, what is the usual protocol which they follow there or in the protocol itself if you have to ask questions like if you notice sir did show you the x ray of a patient and if you all have seen x rays of patients yourself of tk you all notice sometimes that the spacer is a little more in certain patients so you could have asked that question so let's see if we can keep this more interactive so that even you all gain in the process instead of it being a one sided talk right so everyone has kind of uh, seen and treated tk patients in the ipd right yes yes so from that experience i guess everyone can must be having some questions in their head so just try to see if you all can clarify it now okay what's the question no sir i was just telling them sir th sometimes what happens is in our patients we sometimes see the x ray which shows the spacer little more wider compared to the x ray that you had just shared yeah so the spacer can be of different uh, heights is that yeah. the, or it, yes so it depends on how much bone was cut to kind of fit in the processes oh yeah 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 uh, uh it's also depends on uh, bone loss you know mm -hmm. patient or how much osteoarthritis uh, what happens many times is uh can you all hear me and see me yes sir yes sir yes sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. okay all right so let me go back to that slide and i'm sorry about this internet why i don't know what happened uh but this is what we aim for okay and still i'm still connected right everybody so yes, you sir. just need to share your screen because i guess the screen is not seen oh so, you know i'm not sharing the screen no sir oh okay sorry uh how is that now yes sir fine oh, okay good so uh, sorry about that any questions on that so far what we talked about yes sir i have one question yes please Uh, so you mentioned about hematrosis so how can we pick it up early i'm going to tell you i'm going to show you uh, if you feel hematrosis is actually a big lump either on the medial or the lateral side of the knee or in the suprapatellar pouch you feel it as a gelatin it's like a gelatin ball it's not standard effusion effusion is something do you know what the stroke test is yeah sir okay so stroke test is where you stroke the knee from medial to lateral lateral to medial you can actually move the effusion right you cannot yes, move hematrosis because it's once is established early hematrosis like in a day or two it's, it acts like a swelling or effusion but within yeah. few days it becomes gelatinous It becomes more gel, gel like, and it you can't move it. But okay. but there, but the important thing to remember is you never want to have it. And what we're going to talk about today is how never to have it, never to have problems in the knee that are caused mainly by either patient bending the knee too much, or patient doing the stairs or bicycle too aggressively. or therapist bending the knee with passive range of motion too much or patient okay. buckling so it's a, it's a, it's an it doesn't happen regularly it only happens okay. with irregular activity and it's more gelatinous and it's solid and once it happens the only way you can get the range of motion back is actually to take it out and that's another yeah. surgery okay it doesn't happen that commonly the incidence of hematrosis in a patient that's a high risk for dvt is higher than patient mm -hmm. who is low risk because you are putting them on anticoagulants 
Yes, sir. So that's that. So when you read your notes, this is what I tell my all my therapists to read. Don't read everything they do in surgery, but read the surgery time, read the blood loss, know what the patient's risk and what anticoagulation they are using, and then create your plan of care. Okay. Because because lo, lo, usually the blood loss is very minimal, very minimal. The totally surgeries don't bleed because most surgeons will at least periodically use tourniquet. Hip is different because you can't use tourniquet in the hip joint, but knee joint you can use tourniquet periodically. There are some surgeons who do it without tourniquet, but but then they use certain techniques and the TXA to make sure that your blood loss is uh, controlled. Okay, and and they suture it well, and they cauterize at the time of closing to really close all the bleeding areas to really do a good job there. So is it a common complication? Absolutely not. It's not. But we can cause it. And that's my worry sometimes that, that we are sometimes too aggressive. And my first principle is do no harm. Did I answer well your question as well? Did you get the question? Did I answer? Yes, sir. Okay. 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 Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, okay. Sir, usually the drain is kept for that. Yes. So. Yes. See, not every hospital keeps the drain. Many hospitals don't keep the drain. We don't keep the drain routinely on patients, only in certain patients. We do not keep drain in our patients. We have no tolerance for swelling. We have to be very careful because if we swell up the joint, I'll show you what happens and why we should not do it. But some centers do not keep drains in. Do you keep drains routinely, Sona, on every patient? Yes, sir. Okay. How long? 48 hours? Minimum. And then you pull it before the patient goes home? Yes, sir. Surely so. Okay. And then you uh, then you compress and keep it compressed. Yeah, usually our patients are there till 4th or 5th day post-op. That's the usual protocol. And uh, quite, I mean, and some patients who require a little uh, extra care or, you know, the walking is started late. If they are osteoporotic, overweight, sometimes the uh, discharge is shifted to 7th day post-op. Okay. So they're getting, day, they're but getting, otherwise, within fourth day post job, they are fourth or fifth day. Yeah. So yeah, they're getting a lot of attention. Kind of. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. So remember this: that the 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 move towards keeping the patient less than two days is happening all over the world. To do um, uh, multimodal analgesia is happening all over the world. To not have drains in patients routinely is happening all over the world, everywhere. There are certain patients who need it, and we have it too. Sometimes you need it. So this is happening, and this is the this is uh, you will see that, and this is not the only place you are going to work. You're going to work different places. So. Uh, you know, I just want to tell you that you will, sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't see it. Uh, it's not good or bad, but it just, it's the way the trends are today. Okay. So we are going to focus on the left column. So these are minimal goals that most patients have. They want to be able to walk better. They want to be independent with their ADLs. They want to play some games like golf, light dancing, tennis, something like that. They want to be able to play with their grandchildren pain-free. And uh, they want to return to full-time occupation if they can. Those are the normal, normal expectations of patient today uh, that gets a total knee, bilateral or unilateral total knee replacement. Um, uh, that is what they want to do. Some people do more than that. And there are a lot of active patients that are now today doing things that you didn't think they could do 20 years ago or 15 years ago or 10 years ago. So their aspiration is very high. 
So this is a common slide I show everybody. This is the, the total hip and knee class on the left corner there. Uh, bicycling group for after joint replacements, that's gardening or swimming, very commonly done. And golfing, double tennis is also very commonly done by all total knee patients, can be done. I'm not saying everybody does it. Uh, or even downhill skiing is something that people prefer to do. Even with this is a this is my patient actually bilateral total knee replacements. So people do things like that, and they want to be more active. But then it takes special skill from a therapist, uh, from the patient, to get that muscle strength, that quad strength, uh, that uh, coordination, and return to the activities that they can safely perform. And there are certain unsafe things that patients do, and we have to tell them not to do them, like trying to do a lot of sprinting or running or jogging or impact loading, jumping on it. Some things that we don't want to do. This is what we strive for all our patients. Not always we get it, but this is what we strive to get in all our patients. But you don't want to start getting this kind of range of motion in the zero to two weeks. Remember, you are in the inflammatory phase, zero to two weeks. You want to control inflammation. So it's important that we discuss a little bit about prehab. So just to how do you prepare the patient for surgery? And there are some social, and this is a separate lecture. I don't want to talk about this in this lecture, but it's important to know that patients need to be better educated about what this surgery really means. Uh, they need to have some home adaptation. And it can be as simple as having their son come live with them or having some help at home or having uh, meals prepared for them. It can be as simple as that. And then we have to set their expectations right. You know, we always talk to our patients and say, you want to do uh, this activity. Uh, like patients come and say, I want to be uh, competing in the bowling tournament in six months. And uh, I ask them, have you ever bowled before? Did you ever do bowling or something activity? Oh, no, I haven't done it in 10 years. Well, you're not going to get there in three months just because you had a total knee replacement. So setting, setting ex expectations right is very critical for better outcomes, in my opinion. And we don't do a good enough job even at our center to really uh, dig deep into what patients want because we are very busy, we don't have time. But education, home adaptation, arranging for help and support in the first few weeks and setting expectations are a very good part of a prehab uh, protocol. But there are more, there, it is, there is more to that. This is a, this is a big surgery should not be taken lightly and you should be you should be rehabbing appropriately to get better at least that has been my experience overall also the other thing that we have done very successfully is stratify a difficult patient you have to have some kind of risk stratification what is the predictor of poor range of motion after surgery most common Preoperative poor range of motion. If you have preoperative poor range of motion, your protocols have to be different than when you are doing it on a patient that has reasonably good range of motion but has a lot of joint pain or joint degradation. So that that's a this is you can see this patient. She has bone on bone arthritis with deformity and also has a scar from a car accident actually really bad. So it's, it's very close to her scar that would be with the knee replacement. So chance of wound dehiscence, chance of infection are greater in patient like this. When you, when you do her bending, the simplest thing you can do is when you stretch her, you don't remove the staples of the sutures for three to four weeks. What does that do? It allows therapy to happen without wound opening up. Simple, right? If you are going to arrange this patient and the scar in the total knee incision is close to the patient's wound, and if you try to arrange that patient, just keep the 
what we do for a patient like this is we use staples and we'll remove alternate staple. So at two weeks, we'll keep half the staples in and we'll range the patient. And then we remove the staples three weeks later, additional staples. And we do it when we are flexing and extending the knee to see how the staples are reacting. Sometimes we will use those steri strips to close the wound as you are doing therapy to hold the wound in place. Because the last thing you want to have is a wound dehiscence. And what I mean by that, does everybody get this? If you have an incision close by here, I'm drawing it right here, okay? My mouse is going like this. Let's see it's here. And you range it and this starts opening up. The oxygen supply to that area gets less and less. And the skin between this incision and that incision actually goes necrotic. So now you have this big skin hole between two incisions that cannot be filled without a skin graft. Well, you do a skin graft, you are gonna now keep the patient extend, in extension immobilized. So it lost your range of motion. So you have to risk stratify your patients and there's a lot of thinking that goes when you do a difficult case. You know, patient who has a lot of stiffness. We don't have time to, it's a separate lecture about how to stratify risk in a patient. There are some constitutional problems. There are some skeletal problems. There are some muscular problems. And there are some medical problems. And there are some social economic problems. All of those have to be risk stratified. If you want to do everybody that comes through your door and give them, everybody gets a good result. You have to adjust to what you're doing on each patient differently and not just say everybody moves on day two, everybody gets um, muscle stimulation, everybody does this, everybody does that. It doesn't work like that. So in patients that are risk stratification has to be done, you have to think, think a little bit. Ask the patient, was your knee range of motion okay before surgery? Was it moving well? Could you straighten your knee fully? Could you bend it past 90 degrees? That tells you about the patient, where they were before. Because they haven't moved before, they're going to have a difficult time moving now. You see my point? So risk stratification is critical. Therapists can get that even after the first time meet the patient. We have in our evaluation now a column that says range of motion as per the patient before surgery. Like where they were able to move. And I, I ask them simple questions. Would you straighten your leg and put the leg flat down? Could you bend it to at least 90 and I just show them a goniometer? If they couldn't bend it to 90, they're going to have a tough time. We have to modify their therapy program. So risk stratification is critical. But then with that, you can get results like better results. Now what this surgeon, our surgeon did is he didn't want to have wound complications. So this is our original wound, but he did it totally from the side, a little bit side incision. So once you do that, then there's enough. So incision for the total knee is on the side here. Usually it's a medial paravertebral incision. This one was done laterally so that there's enough skin and we could do a good knee replacement on her. This is a special prosthesis that was made for her uh, because of the way her anatomy was. So it was a custom made prosthesis for her, uh, 3D printed, and that was used in her to get full motion. So we had to do a create program for her that was different. We routinely don't use CPMs on anybody, but on her case, because she was preoperatively very stiff, we used a CPM machine. We made splints for her before surgery that we used after surgery to keep her knee extended. And then we got the full result. So there's a value to understanding what the patient does before, and you have to create your own programs for that. But then if you do, this is another case of, uh, and you will see it in a second. You can get good results uh, in uh, five weeks after surgery. You are able to move well. And uh, I think there's one more video.
So if you look at this leg carefully, there is an incision on the side. She had a femur fracture. And I think I can show this better here. I think you will see it. So I'm here with uh, Miss uh, Carolina Cartagena. She is a... I'm not going to show you everything, but I want to show you this. You see that? So I'm going to stop it here. Done about, uh, and you can see the lateral incision that was done for femoral fracture. Uh, and then we did the other surgery. So she had before surgery. Used, uh, see, we identified her problems and then we treated her appropriately. So, you know, we don't have unlimited time. So we've got to move fast with this. Uh, what are our responsibilities as therapists? I always believe patient safety is number one. When we move the patient, the patient has to be safe. We have to be supportive and educate the patient. We should be able to hug the patient and tell them they're going to get better. If we can't do that, we are, not, we are in the wrong profession, in my opinion. So we should be able to be uh, uh, motivating them, supporting them, and educating them at the same time. We have to move the patient along the program when the patient is awake. That's a very difficult job. You know, when we, uh, uh, when we talk to the surgeons, they are spending all their time with the patient when the patient is asleep. There's no response. There's no fighting back. There's no muscle guarding. There is no crying. There is no pain responses. So when we are we are with the patient, patient is awake and we have to move them along. And that is a trick that you learn over time, how to motivate and how to move the patient along. Because if you win the confidence of the patient on the first visit, you're always going to have them. And as I always say, physical therapy is a lot of science, but a lot of art. It's not just science, it's a lot of art. You have to be able to win the confidence of the patient, move the patient along, despite the pain, despite the suffering, despite what they're going through. And it's a tough job. And we all have to learn how to do it. And it takes time. Sometimes it takes experience. And you are new, you are students right now, but you need to remember that your goal is to get the patient to move along a program despite what they are suffering from. On an average, we will spend 700 to 900 minutes per month with the patient. Rest of the all healthcare professionals together spend less than 50 minutes on that patient, except for nurses. But nurses come and go. Therapists are there for long sessions of time. And the last thing that is important to remember is we have to control swelling, prevent avoidable readmissions and additional procedures. And we touched upon it a little bit. We have to control swelling we have to prevent unavoidable readmission. Don't do something that causes a admission again in terms of fall. Fall is the worst thing because you get a periprosthetic fracture, that patient is doomed for failure for the rest of their life. If you get hematoma, that's another surgery. If you have wound diseases, that's a problem. And additional procedures could be manipulation, it could be other things, but not all of these you are doing it in the first two weeks, but definitely controlling swelling is something that we have to do. And I don't know how much you use in India, but we use compression and ice a lot. There is, if you look at the literature, uh, there is, you know, there are many physical therapy modalities that don't have good evidence. The best example is dry needling. Everybody runs around and does it but there's not a single randomized controlled trial, well-controlled trial that is examined, looked at whether you can treat a trigger point with needle, whether you need to put a needle in the trigger point or not. I don't have anything against trigger point dry needling. I'm just saying that the evidence is not there. Ultrasound evidence is not there. Laser evidence is not there in clinical practice, though there is a lot of physiologic evidence. But we run around and do it all the time. But cryotherapy and compression has tremendous amount of evidence in early swelling. At our center, we do ice for 15 minutes with compression every two hours for the first two weeks of phase. 
It is one of the single most important things to get the patient to feel better, control swelling, and ice with compression has a lot more value than ice alone or compression alone. Look up the literature on that if you want. Go to PubMed and do a research on cryotherapy. There's so one what, article by. So what do you all use for compression? Just a ACE wrap. Or we have these we have these new things where the ice uh, when you put the ice wrap in and if you stretch it alone it, it itself is a compression wrap. Okay. There are different ways to do it. There is also a ice man where you fill the water cooler with ice water and then it circulates and it causes compression. There's another game thing called game ready, but you don't have to be so. Uh, I tell my patients to use a frozen peas bag. Frozen peas bag, a frozen vegetable bag on both sides of the knee and wrap it tight. Just make sure that you don't cause skin burns. So you have to put some, some medium between like a pillowcase, put it in a pillowcase or something and wrap it tight. And that's it. That's a simple thing, right? Ace wrap with the two, two piece bags or something or, I, or a Ziploc bag with ice from the freezer. But that is a very important modality and has shown a lot of evidence in controlling early inflammatory process of the patient. So you also recommend a lot of safety exercises in the early phase. I'm going to show that. Yes. We are coming there. So we're coming there. Okay, fine. How much time do we have? So we can go on. No problem. It's actually supposed to be an hour. Okay. I hope the students are okay. To, if it just extends a little bit, I'm sure. Okay. So if we are going for an hour, I, I'm lost my time. No, sir, Let's it's just... around six. Uh, we have about 10 minutes, but I guess we lost connection in between. So I guess we can still go on. No problem. So let's see, you, your time is 6.20. You want to stop at 6.40 your time? Yes, sir. So okay. whatever. I mean, as long as we are able to cover all the relevant points, uh, I guess okay. we should be okay. 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 This is, uh, the ignore the heading, ignore the top part because we don't use bracing for extension. But remember this, that just 20 to 30 cc's of fluid inside the joint causes 35% inhibition of the quadricep muscles. Just 60 cc's, you should measure what 60 cc's looks like. And you should see it's not a whole lot. Patients can't do a straight leg raise. And the paper that is uh, is uh, is down here, the number one, the 20 to 30 cc's of fluid and 35% inhibition is the paper down there. And the 60 cc's and greater is a very famous uh, JBJS American paper and published in 1972, where they took uh, saline and they injected saline every 10 cc's to see when patients stopped, were able to, unable to lift their straight leg raise. So, Controlling intraarticular and extra intraarticular effusion, extraarticular swelling or inflammation are critical in patient success. And th that's the reference right there. And you know, it's not a lot of fluid. It's very little fluid. 60 cc is not a lot. I want you to all take 60 cc, put it in the water, water glass, and see how little it is. And in the knee joint, you don't even sometimes feel it. So it's critical to know that this can happen. So we said zero to two weeks of inflammatory phase. So what do we do for inflammation? We do rice, right? Everybody knows rice? Yes, sir. What does R stand for? So it's uh, rest. Uh... Okay. So I have a big cross against it. Because we don't rest. Uh, my rice is actually, R stands not for rest. My rice is for range of motion. And I call it A rice. Why do I call it A rice? Because it's active range of motion. So it's active range of motion, ice, compression, and elevation. And for total knee patients, when I say elevation, I don't go crazy with uh, having the foot above and all that. 
I don't want the patients to sit in a dependent position for too long. I don't want them sitting with the foot down. That causes problems. So remember this, there is no role of passive range of motion in the two weeks for two weeks after total knee replacement. It's active range of, active and active assisted range of motion with ice compression and elevation. And the only place for heat is if the quad muscle or hamstring muscle, actual muscle, not the joint, is spasms are very painful. Then you can use heat on, on the quad muscle or the hamstring muscle. Okay? So if you don't remember anything from this talk that we did for one hour now, but you remember ARIs and use it for all patients, you will have great success because you will never damage the patient by doing this. Don't ever do aggressive passive motion. Treat the patient's knee as a newborn child, please. Don't treat them like your boyfriend. Treat them like a newborn child. So that's, that's the important lesson to remember. I've learned this over time. I have made my mistakes and I don't want anybody to do the same mistake that I have done. But Remember this ARIS principle, okay? So I guess Manisha is raising her hand. Yeah, Manisha, go on. Yes. yes. Sir, I actually had a doubt. So you said that uh, uh, you tell your patients to avoid sitting, uh, uh, like, you know, the elevation part where you don't let them sit for too long with their legs down. So that includes bedside sitting. And if it does, then uh, for how long do you permit them uh, to do bedside no, sitting? No, that. If you do bedside sitting, we don't allow more than 30 minutes. And we don't, we usually have our patients stand up, sit in a chair and elevate their leg. Okay. In a, in a reclining chair. Right. If so, you don't have a recliner, then you put two pillows behind and right. slide them down. So they are at a 45 degree zip angle. Okay. Thank you. So, so uh, the thing is that uh, if you are not letting the patient sit for more than 30 minutes at a time, but he can do that multiple times in a day. That's yeah, no more than two, three times. At least no more than two times. We don't allow more than two times. They can sit upright in the bed with the legs long in the bed. But if they are dangling, we don't allow them to dangle more than 30 minutes at a time. It causes too much swelling. And that okay. delays their rehab. Okay, thank you, sir. So, but uh, what we have observed also is that the patients not sitting with their legs dangling down, they tend to have more uh, range deficits. Uh, so, would it be a better idea for them to sit for short periods of time with the leg dangling? It's better to avoid it and we just concentrate on mobility. We don't do more than 30 minutes twice a day. And in that position, they are using their other leg to push it backwards, but they're doing assisted everything. Hmm. Nobody's pushing them. It's all assisted. Okay, so the feet have to reach the ground. That's very important. Correct. Yeah, so the swelling... We don't have less. them dangle. dangle, no dangling. dangle, 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 dangle. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's no... We haven't found need for that ever to get range. I'll show you what we do for range in a second. But remember, active range of motion active assisted and not passive. There is no passive manipulation here. So we believe in this a lot uh, because it, it is bypassing the neurogenic inhibition that we talked about two slides before. You should all read about uh, arthrogenic muscle inhibition. It's called AMI. Uh, you should read the references on that. That shows that when you have effusion in the joint, which I showed before the slide, you have inhibition of the quadricep muscles. And the only way to bypass is to yell at the patient loudly to have them send that signal like the coaches do. You know, when the coach is training the athlete, they're yelling so loudly to get them excited. We can't do it in the hospital setting, but you can use electrical stimulation to bypass that, to show them that they can activate their muscles and we believe that it really helps the patient uh, to move along their quad function because 
quads get inhibited very easily after a knee surgery. It doesn't matter what surgery you have. You can have ACL, you can have a meniscal repair, you can have a high tibial osteotomy, you can have a supracondylar fracture, you can have a total knee, and your quads get inhibited very quickly. And it's common, it's common thing to happen. Muscles get inhibited with pain. The quadriceps is an extensor muscle. Pain elicits flexor response, so hamstrings get tighter and quads get weaker. Age is also matters. Age inhibits muscle function overall. Uh, arthrogenic muscle inhibition from joint effusion and instability of the joint also. So there are many reasons why. And instead of talking about it here, you should all read the references on arthrogenic muscle inhibition, AMI. So we use electrical stimulation for that a lot. And uh, this is a position, especially for patients. This is early post-op patient uh, who is uh, two days out from surgery. And uh, you see that back here? Everybody see this here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That can happen because there's a lot of flexion and extension that happens when patient is asleep. So it can happen. Um, and this is a patient who is actually a high-risk patient. He was on uh, anticoagulants and he was a little tight in his hamstrings, gastroc, posterior capsule. So we started him on a program where we have this elevation uh, for a positioning to get the knee extended for periods of time. What's the worry about this? What, what, what is the worry about this position for long periods of time? If I put him in too long a position, what am I worried about? Oh. What puts, what, what structure gets under stretch when I'm in a long sitting like this? Posterior capsule. What else? Yes, posterior capsule is right. Hamstrings, gastrocnemius, what else? Sciatic nerve. Ah, you got it. Who said sciatic nerve? Okay. So yes. sciatic nerve stretch will cause a foot drop. Or it will start first with tingling and numbness, EHL weakness, and eventually a foot drop. So you have to educate the patient that if you sit in this position for too long, you might feel tingly or numb and then just bend your knee. Don't keep it long. Because... These patients are kind of like semi-anesthetized. They might have blocks in them. They may have higher pain medication doses. So they don't feel it as well. So you have to check, make sure that they can function their muscles. So we don't, we don't keep them in long time. We keep them for periods of time. But the one thing that we avoid giving is a pillow under the knee. Okay, we avoid giving pillows under the knee. We try to give pillow below the ankle, not under the heel because heel can get sore. Just above the heel so that heel is free from the, from the pressure. The heel sores are a problem, so you don't put it under the. So that's a common technique. And then we use electrical stimulation to augment the quad contraction to get better extension on the patient. So the only time you are allowed to move the knee, a range knee, a little bit more aggressively is for extension of the knee, but never for flexion in the first two weeks. And the reason is when you're extending the knee, you're closing the skin incision. You're not opening it up by flexing. And your chance of damaging the joint with gentle extension stretch is not as bad as when you're flexing the knee aggressively. So you're allowed to encourage patients who have flexion contracture post-operatively, mostly from the positioning. You're allowed to stretch their gastroc, their hamstrings, encourage them to do a quad set with elevation like this before, and then apply a gentle stretch on the proximal femur or encourage them to go into further extension. My favorite thing is to give them a, a, a gate belt around their ankle and pull it so that they're stretching their gastroc. Gastroc is equally a knee flexor and an ankle plantar flexor. Gastroc is not just a plantar flexor, as you should all know. And uh, hamstrings, of course, and then the posterior capsule, all three. Then is to pull the strap, 
have the ankle stretched and then have them do a quad set and lean forward to stretch their hamstring at the same time. So it's an active stretch with quad activation to extend the knee. At the same time, they're getting a stretch on the gastroc and hamstrings by leaning forward. It's a simple way to encourage them to do this on their own multiple times. Everybody gets this? Okay. So we have zero tolerance for KFC. KFC here stands for knee flexion contractures. We don't allow that. We like to get full extension of the knee as quickly as possible without going nuts. We don't want to do manual therapy, grade four, grade five mobilizations here, but if you want to get as much extension as possible, again, remember gentle, gentle, gentle is the word. This is a typical patient uh, at the time of post-op, like at 10 days post-op, she's had or some staples removed, some staples are still intact. And you can see, let's talk about her problems. What are her problems? Identify her problems for me, please. What does she have? There's an extension. I can't hear. I am not able to hear. Can you be louder? She has an extension lag. Yes. What else? Hamstring tightness. Okay. Good. Why, why are you saying hamstring tightness? Because she's sitting up, right? If she's sitting up, her hamstrings could be tight, limiting her extension of the knee. Good job. Okay. What else? Look at the patient as a whole. I think that should give you a hint. Correct. That's what I want you to see. Okay. I'm going to give it, I'm going to, give it to you. She's, uh, she's obese, right? She's, she's robust. Um, so she's, you have to move her along. That's number one. And, you know, we have to be safe. So we are going to use a cane in the opposite hand to keep that knee stable when she walks or even a walker if we have to. The other thing she has is she has limited knee flexion too. She doesn't go to 90 degrees. We would like to go to patients to 80 to 90 degrees post-op. She's not there yet. So she has that against her. She's wearing her stockings correctly. That's a good thing. We use these uh, DVD prophylaxis stockings on all patients. So she's wearing the stockings correctly. And she's about 10 days post-op. So is she doing very poorly? No. Could she do better? Yeah. So how would you how would you rule out hamstring tightness versus extension lag? What would you do? Oh, we could. How would you? How would you? What would you do to eliminate one or the other? Uh, so uh, there are a few things that we could do in order to understand if it is hamstring tightness, we could uh, put her into a tripod uh, sitting position and see if the range increases. Uh, we can also passively check her range. Uh, if uh, it is uh, the end field will reveal if it is because of quads weakness or the hamstring tightness or the posterior capsule tightness for that matter. Okay. But my question was very simple is how would you in this position what can you do to see that this is extension lag versus hamstring tightness? So we can just ask the person to lean back ah, and keep the hands behind. That's right. That's right. So lean back about 45 degrees. Or if you have a chair, you're sitting in a chair, then you can just have a lean back, hold it. And then, and then 45 degrees is critical. Why is 45 degrees critical? You have to go back to your biomechanics 101. What is the angle of hip flexion in walking? What is the angle of knee of hip flexion? Everybody knows the knee flexion angle is zero to six seventy zero to sixty eight degrees. What's the hip flexion angle? Forty degrees. 
So when you are advancing your leg, maximum flexion at the hip is 40. At that time, knee is fully extended. So if you want her to be functional, <clears throat> you have to test the hamstring tightness at 45 degrees and not at, not at 90 degrees as you're taught. Everybody gets taught. Hamstring tightness, popliteal angle. But nobody functions in popliteal angle. Everybody functions at 45 degrees. Only the athletes function at 90 degrees or hurdlers or sprinters. They need 90 or more degrees of flexion and full extension at the knee. I'm not saying you should not strive for it. It's a good thing to have it, flexibility. But for a post-op patient day 10, all you want is full extension at the knee with hip at 45 degrees of flexion. That's your functional range of motion for your hamstrings. Everybody get that? This is something yes, that is not commonly taught and no criticism on schools. It's just that it's, it's, it's a different way of looking at a patient and not looking at absolute anatomy. Absolute anatomy dictates that popliteal angle measurement is done at 90 degrees of flexion. At our center, we always do it at 45 degrees of flex, hip flexion and at 90 degrees of hip flexion for the same reason. Because then you know. And what I try to do is have the patient position themselves at 45 degrees of flexion and then have them actively extend the knee first and then passively extend the knee to see the difference. And that's your, that's your part hamstring versus part. We do a similar test for gastrocnemius in the ankle, but this is not the time. We've got to finish this in time. So I'm trying to go fast. Uh, this is, should we allow this? I have this for you in slow motion. Should I allow this patient to do this? Is it safe? I mean, he looks stable in his knee when he weight bears, but how does he achieve it? Look at his left hand. What if he has to lose his balance and he has to hold something? He's already stuck with his hand on his waist. So I would, I would not allow him to use just a single point cane post-op. I would use a walker or two crutches or two canes because he's not stable. If, what if he buckles like this? He can buckle easily. Because why? Because his knees, knee is not fully straight. We haven't done a good enough job to get his knee straight in walking. So extension lag in walking is far more critical than extension lag on the table. Because if you have extension lag on the walking, which could be posterior capsular tightness, it could be lack of hamstring flexibility. And this actually shows you that. If you go back, I'll go slow. You see the hip is trying to flex to about 45 and the knee is coming down, but the knee cannot extend fully. So it could be from a combination of hamstrings, it could be posterior capsule, it could be quad weakness, it could be all three. But a bottom line, he's stabilizing his knee or limb somehow by using his hand. He couldn't walk without that. He had to use this hand to guide his femur. So you should not allow patients to walk like this, in my opinion, and have stability in stance is a critical gait component that we need to achieve for safety. All the we way strive up, for way this all the, up, all the time. Good, and all the way down. But then we ask them to push it down all the way. So we call that a heel slide with quad activation. So what they're doing is they're flexing. This is a, post, a seven days post-op patient. 
and we use a, a sliding board, uh, a flexible plastic board so that it can slide better. And they are doing active flexion followed by quad contraction, gluteus maximus contraction to extend the knee fully down. And we call this safety exercise, slide and flex, tighten and extend. You can do it with the gate belt as assistance, or you can do it without gate belt as shown here. Now, let me tell you the secret about this exercise. This exercise alone eliminated all need for CPM machine in every hospital in the United States. In 1960, uh, early 80s and 90s, everybody was using CPM machine. Then people started doing this simple exercise 100 times a day. So you slide your heel, bend your knee actively, or sometimes with assistance, and then you contract your quadriceps, your gluteus maximus, and extend it all the way down and hold it down for a second or two, and then bend again. I have all my patients do this at least 100 times a day. Not one, at one time. Uh, you know, sometimes they can do 30 at a time or 20 at a time, depending on their situation. Is it very expensive to get this type of board? It's nothing different than getting a cutting board, vegetable cutting board, and putting it under, or a wooden wooden board. You have those in the PT department, I'm, I'm sure. Sliding board is a very common thing. So we use it always on our patients. We got this made from a company so it's plastic, it can be cleaned very easily. The wood cannot be cleaned that easily. So we have plastic that we can clean easily. You can also do it in the assisted fashion. So, next slide. All the way up, all the way up. So this is a little bit advanced one where I'm helping the patient and I'm just guiding the patient. He's doing all the work. So I'm guiding the patient gradually. And this is about just two weeks out. And I'm watching for the knee swelling. I'm watching for the knee reaction. Sometimes I'll have the bandage taken off so I can watch the incision. And then I have them push it down gradually. And I have them contract into my hand. So if trust me on this. If you do this exercise well early on, you will never have knee stiffness. Or you'll have less knee stiffness than you ever had before. But you have to guide the patient. You cannot do passive range of motion. It has to be active range of motion with active assistance and then static contraction of the quadriceps to push it down all the way is the key to get that full extension at the knee. You know, one of the keys of success for any knee rehab is what I call getting that last five degrees of extension actively, allowing that screw home mechanism to lock the knee in extension is the key to all success for walking. Because once you get that extension in walking, you always use it. So getting that, that mechanism to have full extension at the knee and lock the knee and terminally, is probably one of the key uh, important things that you can take away from here. So that's another important thing I do. This is another way, this is a little bit advanced. This is like two weeks out, his staples have been removed. Uh, just that day, and he's here, and then you can use a use this towel again to make it even easier, and then push it down all the way, and they can resist it by holding the hands tighter and push it down all the way. So that's another way to do it. So there are many ways to do it. Not every patient does so beautifully. There are various degrees of flexion that patients do, but the goal is to get there. Uh, can you see the patellar mobilization slide? You can see that, right? So this is my recipe. Again, I'm gentle. I start this early on and I, I move the patella inferior, lateral, superior, all directions, except for I don't be aggressive moving the patella uh, uh, laterally too much. The reason I don't move patella laterally too much is because our incisions are medial parapatellar 
though they are straight down the patella, once you go after the skin, the next incision to the capsule is medial parapatellar. And sometimes they have to take a sleeve of the vastus, uh, vastus medialis with the periosteum and reflect it to get the exposure to the knee. So I don't want to lateralize the, the patella too much. So I don't focus on that, but I focus on lateral to medial, inferior to superior, superior to inferior. Does everybody know how much the knee, the patella has to move up and down for adequate knee flexion? What's the arthrokinematics of the joint? Everybody knows that we have a, a rollback in the sagittal plane. When the knee goes flexion past 60 degrees, there's a rollback. That's why we have a knee joint axis that's in J, right? How much does patella have to go superior to inferior for full flexion at the knee? Anybody know? In adult patient? I'm gonna give you the answer. It's about seven, seven centimeters. So the patella has to go from, is a full extension to flexion inferiorly seven centimeters and about one to one and a half centimeter medially. If the patella doesn't move, the knee joint cannot bend. And 99% of the problems of knee stiffness are not because the knee joint is not moving, it's the patellofemoral joint that doesn't move. I call that a captured patella syndrome. The patella gets captured due to inflammation and fibrosis with suprapatellar pouch and fibrosis of the extensor mechanism, the patella doesn't write down. If patella doesn't write down, the knee can't bend. If patella doesn't write up, if it's in infrapatellar position, you can't extend the knee. You have to have the patella ride up into extension in a patient with flexion contracture to have the knee extension. So lack of knee extension, one of the causes is lack of patellar mobility. You have to have superior mobility of the patella in order to get knee extension, just like you have to have patellar mobility inferiorly to get knee flexion. This is a, one of the lessons I learned over time. I learned it through hard work, learned it through going into operating room to see what the patella looks like, how it moves. There's a great experiment that somebody did. They took a screw with the knee fully extended into a cadaver, fresh frozen cadaver and put the screw to the patella onto the femur. And then they tried to bend the knee. The knee can only bend 30 degrees. So when you allow the knee to bend only 30 degrees or 40 degrees, what happens to that patella? It gets stuck down. It gets fibrosed in that position. So if you don't move the patella, you have to move the patella to get knee range of motion. And you can start that early, gently, not too aggressively. Okay, I'm going to show you the video of the other thing that I do commonly. So the other thing that I've learned over time <clears throat> is the incision that extends past the superior pole of the patella up down. There is some you know, when you, when you, you've all seen the knee surgery, right? The patella gets everted laterally and <clears throat> there is some cutting of the, of the soft tissues around it. The common occurrence of fibrosis is under the quadriceps tendon in the suprapatellar pouch and the connectivity of the musculotendinous junction of the quadricep muscle. I have seen where if you go with the scope later on for a stiff knee, you have actually fibrous bands that go from vastus intermedius and the rectus tendon into the bone itself, getting adherent to the bone. So one of the things that I've learned to do over time is also do what I call musculotendinous mobilization. So I go all the way up over the incision and move the incision lateral to medial. So other than the patellar mobilization that I showed, I do this also in early post-op phase. I want to get that, that muscle mass around the quad tendon 
moved lateral to medial. You have to do it very carefully. Please don't be aggressive with this. Be gentle like a newborn child. But if you do it, you can get good results of mobility. And the holy grail of knee flexion range of motion is not muscle tightness, it's patellofemoral mobility. You get patellofemoral mobility, superior to inferior, slightly medial, you're gonna get good range of motion. You like this? I do not allow my patients to go up with their surgical side because it causes too much swelling and inflammation. So I always tell them to go up with the good and down with the bad. Bad, we don't say bad, we say surgical leg and good is the unoperated leg. But they understand good and bad very easily, quickly. You know, you got to make it simple for patients sometimes. They're using one hand on a railing or a crutch and they're going up with the good, down with the bad, never stressing that joint. I'm telling you, you reduce swelling, you control swelling, you do active range of motion, encourage them to walk more, you will have a great result. And you don't need a lot of therapy after a month of, first month of surgery, you'll, you'll be done. And then you can move on to, if you can get all the range obtained in the first four to six weeks of motion, of surgery, then you can focus on that patient for next month for strength, functional activities, plyometrics, or whatever you want to do, and get that patient to a phase where they feel adequate to move, you know, and to be able to walk faster. One of my passionate things is they have to be able to move and walk faster. That's health. Speed of walking is a sixth vital sign. We need to be able to have enough range of motion and good muscle control that they can walk fast. They go for walks. In Pune, everybody walks. So they want to walk. They want to go fast walking everywhere. And uh, we'll talk about that at a separate time. We'll do a, a walking seminar at some point with Sona's permission. And we'll talk about just walking as a therapeutic activity. But you want your patients to walk at three kilometers per hour for 30 minutes five times a day. That's health. And we need to get there, okay? And this is just a final slide. We allow this no resistance for our patients. And this video is not going to play well, but you can see the knee a little bit. So we use a bicycle for our bilateral, unilateral total knees, no resistance. They're using their leg just to support it to move along. As long as they are past 90 degrees, they will use this uh, commonly. Um, and uh, uh, we are going to end here. We are already over time. But remember in summary, <clears throat> active range of motion, no passive insert to the joint, encourage the patient and assisted activities, uh, uh, intermittent walking and not dangling, taking care of the muscle control, making sure that you can get full extension quickly and flex to tolerance. Our goal would be to 80 to 90 degrees within two weeks of surgery. That would be ideal goal. We don't achieve it all the time, but we have to strive for goals so we can at least have a goal setting for us. And in, in, if we do get in two weeks, then we can get it on in one month, all of it. So we're going to end here. If you have questions, you can ask. Otherwise, we're going to stop because... We went over, way over time with this. But the, frankly speaking, didn't realize the time. Uh, I guess Renuka is raising a hand. Do you want to ask a question? Uh, yes, ma'am. Hello? Yes. Can you speak loudly, yes. Renuka? Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. So, uh, so, regarding stair climbing, so if in case of unilateral knee replacement, other knee is, uh, for example, uh, osteoarthritis. Yeah, what do you do for... What do you do for bilateral knees? Is that the question? No, sir. Yes, I mean, that also could be one of the questions. Okay. But I guess what she's asking is if one of the other knee, which is not operated, is also having a grade three way or something, right? That's what you're asking? Yes, ma'am. It's sure. difficult. Yes. Yeah. If they have the range, even if they have arthritis, we will do a one railing 
one hand on the railing and one cane in the opposite hand and do it with the same principle. We, in our center, we usually do staged bilateral, meaning one week apart. We'll do left knee first or right knee first, and then one week later, we'll do the other knee. Uh, that's a bilateral knee going up and down the stairs is a very challenging thing. And I tell my patients to avoid it for at least 10 days, if they can. Okay, sir. Thank you. Ajari, do you want to ask a question? Uh, yes, ma'am. I wanted to ask that, uh, like, what is the criteria to progress for stair climbing? And, uh, you mean alternate steps? Yes, alternate steps and uh, as well how uh, how many days after post-op we can begin with stair climbing. Like, so said that 10 days we don't ask the patient to stair climb. And That's, then uh, yeah. yeah, what I do <clears throat> in my clinical practice is I want to have full extension at the knee and I feel for resistance. They must have offer some resistance in full extension or within okay. <clears throat> not full extension within 10 degrees even is I'll take it but they must <coughs> offer some resistance to me when I do it number one number two they should have no swelling mm -hmm. that's my key and and if they don't swell up after I do exercise and they don't swell up I allow them to start doing it within two to three weeks time so your video it's is off by some chance and so you couldn't stop your presentation if that's possible yeah, I can do that. Hold on one second. Yeah. And Sajri also what Sir must have mentioned is uh, when we are in the post-operative period, they are still doing yes. it uh, up with the good and down with the bad. Yes. But I yes. guess, Sir, uh, if I remember right, five video is on. I don't know why video is not seen. So uh, you can first end your presentation. I think that can be one. Yeah, Sir, so your video is on. Okay. And so one more thing that I, if I remember right, is you do start the alternate staircase training after five to six weeks post-op? No, no. Three, three to four weeks. Between three, three four and four weeks. weeks. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I hope, Sajiri, that answers the question. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Krishna, yeah. You uh, in my ahead. opinion, in my yeah. opinion, <clears throat> there is no rush hmm. to have reciprocating gate, reciprocating stairs. Okay. If you are going to cause a harm to the knee joint. There's no rush. There's no need. You don't want to invade the inflammatory phase of two weeks. We have to appreciate that inflammation as a problem. Krishna, you want to ask a question? Um, yes, ma'am. So uh, how many days post-op should we commence with the cycling part? And how much should be the knee flexion range of motion for that? For a recumbent bike, at least 90 degrees. Between 80 and 90. Okay. For a recumbent bike. For a vertical bike, 110. And within 5 degrees of extension. You don't want to have a flexion contracture and do a bike. Okay. Any other questions or I hope we can kind of wrap up. I guess we have overshot the time, but it's been very informative. I'm sure everyone has got some gems of wisdom here or at least about clinical practice. I guess you all are going to look at all post-op knees in a very different light right now, right? We're actually going to see what the issue is, uh, where the stiffness is coming from. I guess starting from the thing that be gentle, 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 treated like a newborn baby, to control swelling with compressive pull packs, no legs dangling, the legs should reach the floor. And uh, if I remember right, sir, I remember the patients, whenever they were sitting with their legs, feet touching the floor, there used to be a soft cloth which was placed at the end of the feet in which they used to kind of do the sliding exercises even when they were sitting. Yeah. So that was one thing which was followed to the T by as a Post-op protocol. Yeah, and, so uh, with the soft cloth that they can extend and flex exactly. as they are sitting there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And of course, about a rise uh, or a rise, as we call it, as so active <laughs> ROM with uh, ice compressive 
compression and elevation and the elevation is always with a little roll which is kept proximal to the heel what problems can arise the sciatic so be careful about that the enemy is to overcome the muscle inhibition safety exercises of course we heard a lot about that and at times it's assisted by the therapist and belt but never passive so please no. keep that in mind and uh, keys to success would be the last 5 degrees of active extension i guess if the students remember what i also tell them in the clinics is please get the extension first instead of working on the flexion so next thing would be the patella and i guess the holy grail of getting knee flexion is to concentrate on the patellofemoral joint because the captured patella syndrome is usually because of some adhesions which might take place at the patella tendon area or in the suprapatellar quadriceps so that's where we kind of need to move but still carefully and gently as uh, showed the incision uh, mobility also and encourage them to walk more staircase we already know up with the good down with the bad and i guess after one month if we have achieved the goal of mobility we can move on to strength function and eccentric training along with alternate stair climbing which we do not have to rush for uh, and the bicycle of course which can be done as so kind of prescribed so all in all i guess we have all got what we need to do in the 0 to 2 weeks and even beyond that so sir very very helpful session i yeah. guess we are going to look forward to our next month grand rounds and okay. um, we are going to take it and hopefully next time we'll kind of have no internet issues so we'll have sir for okay. that for one hour and we'll take it forward okay so, so that was a good summary and nice meeting you all bye 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 sir bye bye thank you sir thank you all